This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to a special town hall edition of Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. And I'm Robert Travis Scott, president of the Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana. Today's global economy demands a more educated workforce, more students graduating from high school prepared for college or a career. The good news is that last year, Louisiana's graduation rate reached nearly 74%, an all-time high. But four parishes in the state graduated less than 60% of their students in 2013, and 20 parishes saw an increase in their dropout numbers. Well, the American Graduate Initiative is a long-term commitment by the nation's public media to share solutions to the high school dropout crisis in their communities. LPB is proud to present tonight's program as part of the American Graduate Initiative. Over the next hour, we'll examine dropout prevention programs in Louisiana from pre-K all the way up to the high school level. We'll meet champions around the state and here in the studio who are helping students reach destination graduation. For these three and four year olds in South Louisiana, their journey towards high school graduation has already begun. Research shows that children can already be behind at the age of nine months with their learning and their development. So without high quality programs, then children are gonna continue, that gap is gonna to continue to increase, so children may eventually drop out of school. Crystal Leon is the coordinating partner for early learning in West Baton Rouge Parish, which is one of 15 in the state piloting the Cohort One program. It's part of the state's efforts to revamp early education as required by the legislature. The program helps children to make a more seamless transition into kindergarten. Cohort One has allowed us to um, integrate curriculum and standards from birth to five so that children whether they're in child care, Head Start, or pre-K, we're all learning the same standards. Teachers at child care centers use early learning standards to guide instruction rather than random activities. While Leon admits the new approach may be challenging, it's paying off. We see that with our pilot partners from Cohort 1. The second year, things have just totally changed. They're completely involved. They've brought in their teachers, see the benefits, and how just a little bit of preparation makes your day go by so much smoother. According to data from the National Dropout Prevention Center, students are either pushed out of school due to lack of academic skills or discipline problems, or pulled out because of personal and family issues. The graduation rate of black males in Louisiana is less than 50%. 100 black men of Metro Baton Rouge is helping to change that statistic by targeting students in middle school. Vernell Boudreaux is chairman of Project Excel. At that age uh, and time in their lives, uh, peer pressure is one of the problems that they, they run across. And for us to uh, intervene at that time is very important. We get involved with kids at that age and we're trying to get them to make positive decisions on what they want to do with their lives and which way they want to want to go. Members help the students chart a five-year plan that includes graduation. Boudreaux says 90 percent of the students earn a diploma, but that's not all. The, the young men who continue in our program from middle school all through high school, we offer them a $4,000 scholarship uh, for them when they go on to college or trade school for them uh, at uh, 500 per semester. Jonathan Jackson is a senior. He attributes all of his success to Project Excel. If I wasn't part of Project Excel, I'd be a 10th grader this year. I wouldn't have got promoted twice. 
I couldn't, I couldn't go play, I couldn't be here, I couldn't, I'd probably be somewhere locked up or somewhere because I know I've, I've did stuff in my past, but I've looked up and I've, you know, grown over the years and I've learned that that's not the life for me. Another dropout prevention program called Choices is being used in Sabine Parish. The focus is on helping junior high students understand the downside of not having a high school diploma. We bring them up, we pay them their salary, and then we allow their friends to come up and be their landlord, the electric company, and obviously the goal of the game is to, for they run out of money before they pay all their bills. And this really makes it real for the students. It allows them to see that, hey, this is not going to be enough money for me to live the way I want to live. Lori Morrow is dean of the Northwest Louisiana Technical College. She works in partnership with the Sabine School District and the Rotary Club to reach students at a time when they are most vulnerable to calling it quits. Students in the 7th, eighth, 8th, eighth, eighth and ninth grades are in what we call the transitional years. And it's very important that we keep a close eye on students at this age because these are the times when we can identify potential dropout students and um, those students who have poor grades, the students who have poor attendance, and perhaps guide them and steer them back on the graduation path. Until recently, students who failed the eighth grade LEAP test were held back. State up. Education it Superintendent John White calls that a double whammy. Material. The further they fall behind, then the more likely they are to never make it through high school. So we changed that. White says the state is implementing a transitional ninth grade. In that transitional ninth grade, kids get counseling services, the remediation, the supports, the extra supports they need, but we're also allowing them to go on and keep learning at the high school level rather than keeping them back with the younger kids in middle school. For children who have been expelled from school, the Rapides Alternative Positive Program for Students is a path back. Principal Matt Burns. It's really important to have a program like RAPS because we're getting those students that made a mistake, that had a consequence. They're coming to a place where we can help them with discipline. We can help them with structure. Uh, we can let them know about our expectations of how or what we know will be successful for them to go back to their school. This boot camp style program incorporates physical training to help students earn their way back into their original schools. But continuing their bad habits extends their stay. It's a lot of discipline over here you got to have in order, in order to get out. Because if you don't have discipline, you're just going to be on the same day again. Learn that drugs really isn't the answer. And if you really want to be successful, you got to get an education and you got to do something with yourself. No matter which approach is used to keep students in school and on a path to graduation, it all begins with the intervention of a caring adult. We have the, the students that, that are expelled, and they say the worst of the worst, but we have good kids here. We have really good kids here, and, um, and they're, they're here, but they're here with, with teachers that want to be here also, that want to teach them. And I think if you just set the bar high for them and, and tell these students, these are our expectations and these are the expectations you're going to have to meet, um, I think uh, they can put their mind to it and do it. Well, thanks to those champions in the Dropout Prevention Program for sharing their stories. We have in our studio this evening some other champions I would like to introduce to you, and we'll have a robust conversation, I am sure. First, Ronald Smith, who is one of the founding members and now executive director of the ExxonMobil YMCA in North Baton Rouge. Kelly Ratcliffe is a ninth grade counselor at Ruston High School's Freshman Academy, which helps students transition from eighth into ninth grade. John Daniel is the executive director of Boys Hope Girls Hope Baton Rouge, a residential program dedicated to helping children in need realize their full potential through education. Warren Drake serves with the Department of Education, providing administrative support to school districts. He's also the former superintendent of the Zachary Community School District. John Smith is Vice President for Operations of 100 Black Men of Metro Baton Rouge. His chapter sponsors Project Excel, a mentoring program for middle school students. So before we go to this conversation, though, let's look at some data that Robert Travis Scott has for us from the LSU Public Policy Research Lab. Yes, Beth, LSU's Public Policy Research Lab conducted a survey of 100 Louisiana residents on tonight's topic. And among the findings, uh, when asked who is primarily responsible for decreasing the school dropout rate, the majority of respondents, 66 percent, 
say the parents, 10% say the student, and 10% say government. Only 8% say the teacher is primarily responsible. When asked to rank the effectiveness of dropout prevention options, 27% of those surveyed rank investing in early childhood education as number one, followed by investing in alternative programs and providing incentives for children to show up at school, both receiving support from 23% of residents. And when asked when students should be targeted with anti-dropout programs, 45% of those surveyed said middle school, junior high, followed by elementary school and high school, chosen by 38 and 13% of respondents, respectively. So those results should give our panelists something to reflect on, Beth. Well, we'd like our panelists to kick off the conversation. First, just briefly, from each one of you, what do you think is the biggest challenge for you uh, to address this high school dropout problem? Let's begin with you, Ron. Um, very good question, Beth. I think one of the big issues is the attendance. If you're not attending, you're not going to be able to accomplish your goals there. Uh, one of those things I'm sure you'll see that the higher the lack of attendance, the higher the dropout rate will be. So mm -hmm. attendance will be my major. All righty. And Kelly, what about you? Well, when I get students, they're ninth graders. And if they're already behind, I think that, that's a hard situation mm -hmm. for us. If they're already, if they're behind in reading or um, they're discouraged already, it's hard to encourage them. Okay. Uh, John? In I think the biggest challenge is a lack of community engagement with concentric circles of support that build these kids with their social, emotional, academic, ethical, and economic skill sets. Okay. And Warren? I think a passionate, motivated teacher in the classroom is always the best thing we can do. That's the most, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's the most important thing. But also our kids need to see the light at the end of the tunnel. They need to understand mm -hmm. when they get through with their educational process, there's something waiting for them and they're qualified to do it. Okay, and John? Um, I, I think that uh, one of the most impactful things is experiences and exposures. As you can change the experiences and exposures that young persons are introduced to, they begin to make better decisions and different decisions just because they see other options in life. Uh, good points, all of you. And uh, let's engage our audience right now. How about Robert? You know, Beth, we have someone in our audience who deals with a program that's targeted at middle school students. I want to ask Juliet to, to step up here and tell us a little bit about this program, City Year and Enroll Now. Um, City Year Baton Rouge is an AmeriCorps program. Uh, I work at Capitol Middle School with uh, Diplomas Now, where we target um, the dropout crisis by focusing on a student's attendance, behavior, coursework, the ABCs, as well as also coaching them on social and emotional skills um, in order to see, um, as many of the panelists were saying, uh, the future that sometimes they can only see what's right in front of them, and we want to push them forward and all the way through. Now, you have a chance with these experts up here to shoot a question at them that might be applied to what, what you do. Um, yes, I would love to. Uh, Capitol Middle School is actually right down the road from 100 Black Men, and I was wondering, Mr. John Smith, uh, what are ways that City Year, Baton Rouge, and Capitol Middle could get involved with Project Excel, um, specifically targeting those students who are already behind um, and struggling to keep up, if not? Excellent question, and we're talking about developing a relationship with Capital Middle School to come in and create what we call what they see is what they will be, introducing them to financial literacy, introducing them to, to career choices. Talk to them about what's your story today and what will your story be five years from now. So the opportunity there is for us to partner with those students, especially the African American males, during the day, but more importantly, after school. And really what's going to be important is the collaboration between us, the student, the parent, and the school because that's where you make a difference when you bring the parents into the equation. Well, yes, I have great a perspective on that. Jordan, stand up. This is Jordan Lee. Now, Jordan is uh, now very famous. I saw her on the stage of the Kennedy Center because she was one of the winners of a poetry slam competition conducted across the United States, and it was part of the American Graduate Initiative. And I didn't know she was a winner, and I realized we had a winner from Louisiana, so I was excited about that. And I've been dying to ask you, Jordan, tell me, uh, I mean, has, what has poetry meant to you, or the arts, about staying in school? The arts are a huge part about why 
I mean, I was able to stay in school because of just how it involves you in, you know, the school community and so many people, you know, teachers and everything. They're just really supportive and it makes you really well-rounded, you know. It gives you that kind of initiative to go. It's something fun to do. The thing I wrote my poem about was about how I went to, like, this kind of historical school where the Little Rock Nine integrated it and segregated it, desegregated it, I'm sorry, um, and how there's, like, you know, a lot of pride in that and why the African Americans actually have the highest rate of dropping out, but I feel like our ancestors have worked, like, you know, really hard. So I guess my question to you is kind of, like, do you feel like this, all these you know, that minorities in general, African Americans, are really failing the system, or is it kind of like something about the system that is failing our African Americans? Okay. Now, who would like to take that one? <laughs> Daniel I'm question. looking at them here. <laughs> okay. All right. I believe it's a combination of both, and I thought your question was excellent. You know, we, we live in a world, an ecology, if you will, and people can make choices, and they could be good or bad choices. On the other hand, there are sometimes institutional challenges that make that ecology toxic. And I think the key is we want to be victors and not victims. A victim is somebody who through their own ignorance or the institution, some impersonal institution, are injured. A victor uses their head, their heart, their habits, and their hands to solve problems. And that's what has to happen. Well, Ronald, you want to jump in on this one? Yes, that is a problem that's, that's universal. And, and you mentioned just in the African-American community, there's some so socioeconomic situations that happen there, too. Uh, we look at the YMCA at the holistic approach. We want to make sure that those individuals are acquiring the nutritional and the physical benefits that they need to be uh, proficient in their daily school activities. If you come from an environment where you're not getting a good meal in the morning, you're not healthy, then you're not going to be able to excel in those areas. So there's a lot of other factors that go along with it other than just the, the minority situation also. Do you think some younger people perhaps have lost a sense of history though? Is that one of the things that, John? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think one of the things we have lost is a sense of history and a sense of urgency. Uh, during the era that you were speaking of, that was a sense of urgency. I must do better. I must move to the next level. Sometimes we become complacent and say, I've already arrived and I do not have the same sense of urgency, the parents as well as the children. I, I believe that was, I believe she's referring to Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas as well. So I, one of the things that impressed me with you is that you, you bloom through the, through the arts. And I think that we have to provide our kids every opportunity to succeed through art, music, athletics. Instruction is always number one, but you have to provide students a way to enjoy going to school. They have to have fun in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Rob, to you. Well, you know, Beth, we have a lot of deep thinkers on this subject, and we have with us uh, Jonah, who is a researcher and a deep thinker on this. Jonah, tell, tell us a little bit about who you are, the organization you work for. Yeah, I work for the Cowan Institute in New Orleans, and we uh, work to advance the success of young people through research and policy advocacy and programming. Um, and we recently found that actually one out of every five New Orleanians is actually uh, between the ages of 16 and 24 is disconnected from school or from work. Um, and we recently did a, a, a report with some focus groups asking some of the students themselves what the causes were of that. And one of the things that I think surprised us was how many of those factors were happening outside of the classroom, that it was, uh, these were students that were suffering from, you know, there were uh, violence in their communities, they were caring for their siblings, there was so much else that was going on. I wonder what you would like to see uh, in ways that community groups and social service providers can actually coordinate and complement uh, better what, it, what is happening inside the classroom. I think your question is outstanding, and, and this is what I was sharing before, the community engagement component. Imagine that the child is in the center of a set of circles, and every circle they walk into has to sing from the same hymnal. If one is antisocial and the other is social, you got a problem. It's like having a mommy and daddy that says, one says I can have a piece of candy, the other says, end up the kid's going to play that family. I think the key here is, and if you look at community engagement as espoused by the Gallup organization, we can predict the community is going to do well when the community at large, whether it's the church, whether it's a school, 
whether it's the parents, are working together progressively. There's something called the Children's Youth Planning Board, which a couple of members are sitting up here. Our job is to try to uh, aggregate and bring together the resources of the community, and we have. Uh, Boy Soap, Girl Soap of Baton Rouge basically survives and moves forward because it's engaged with the community. Whether it be the YMCA, whether it be uh, Sid Gotro's Sheriff's Department, we have to work with them in order to bring our kids to graduation from high school, graduation from college, learning life skills, and learning the kind of skills they need to be successful in a career. Well, Kelly Ratcliffe, you <coughs> work as a school counselor. Do you agree with his perspective, and what do you think the solution is? Well, I, I think that what we talked about with our last question, the student involvement in activities outside of school, whether it be the community or I'm a big proponent of athletics or activities, clubs that involve students' time after school, because that is a time that is hard for some students because of their community, their neighborhood, what they're going home to. So that's why I, I like to see kids involved in those activities that um, require them to stay later or they're, they're plugged in with teachers and, and activities. I think that's important. Yeah. I, I think Mr. I think Drake wants to uh, let me add something to that too. I think we have a tendency to separate school from life and it's a part of life. It's one of the most important parts of life. So instead of it being something else we do, kids are learning all the time. They're learning when they go from class to class. They're, they're learning when they go on a field trip. They're learning. So everything is, is a part of the whole being of education. And, and when we stop thinking about it's something else we do and, and, and putting it in the whole child, then, then it becomes, it becomes a, a culture that the kids begin to uh, buy into, for lack of a better word, and, it, and they're excited about being there. They want to be there. They want to be a part of that culture that is their life because it is their life. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks for all the work you're doing down at the Cowan Institute at Tulane. Beth? Well, well, I have a graduate of one of the programs with me right now, Craig Young, and you were part of the 100 Black Men Mentoring Program, were you not? I just asked him how old he was. I thought maybe he was 18. That's a reflection on how old I am. Uh, but you're 24. Now tell me, tell me about the mentoring program that you were involved in. Okay, well, the organization that I work for is called Ikaya Youth Project, and Ikaya is a Zulu term. It stands for home. And we work with children with emotional or behavior disturbances, and our main goal is to help those youth advance and take ownership of, uh, of their lives, their situations, so they can be successful adults. So you yourself, though, graduated from the 100 Black Men Mentoring Program, right? Yes, I did graduate from the 100 uh, Men Program. Well, do you have a question? for one of our panelists? I do. Uh, we talked about community involvement, and I wanted to know uh, kind of what was the panel's thoughts on uh, a couple of steps that uh, a community that, that wants to get involved, but they might not know exactly the, the, the proper direction to go. Um, um, there's a lot of community leaders that are, that are, that are looking to uh, support their community, and I just kind of, what would some of y'all thoughts if somebody would have come and say, hey, I want to advance my community, um, a couple of um, so So some practical advice mm -hmm. here. Practically, all right, yeah. yeah sure. Well, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, we've got to offer opportunities in different areas where kids can enjoy those opportunities and also have a reward or relationship with participating in those opportunities. And if the community can cre create opportunities where kids can be rewarded and enjoy those opportunities and, and grow from them, then that's the start. Because if, as we mentioned before, if kids are not enjoying what they're doing, then your success of having them stay involved is not going to be great. But so if somebody comes to you, as Craig was saying, and says mm -hmm. to you, a, a community member, I want to help, I want to be involved, what's the first thing they should do? Well, we've done that a couple of times in the 100s, and the model that we use is we talk about, first of all, what is it that you like to accomplish, what are your passions, and what are your goals. From that, we begin to talk about strategies, but we, we talk about engagement versus involvement. Engagement says we are a team and we're equal, so let's put ourselves on equal footing and first say you're welcome, I welcome your, your comments, I welcome your thoughts. And normally when you tell the person I welcome your comments and thoughts, then they feel more comfortable with moving to the next step. So it's about making them feel welcome first. All right, yeah, Leslie. In, in Lincoln Parish, we, we have community leaders coming into our elementary schools to read on a regular basis to our students. It could be simple things like that. But in Lincoln Parish, we do have a great um, uh, number of 
people that are just in the community and want to come in and we're able to tell them where to plug in and I know that things like the reading and mentoring and talking to students is something that we welcome. But you know, Warren, across Louisiana, it, it varies from parish to parish, school to school. Some schools aren't as welcoming for community members to come into them. They don't really want outside help. Is that true? Well, I, I haven't had that experience, but I will say this, the State Department of Education has added a community service endorsement to its new diploma. So I think even the State Department of Education realizes that it takes a community. And so part of the endorsements that kids can start earning in, in with freshmen this year, it will be a community uh, endorsement that they have to do so many hours. So I think that's a good move. That's a great reckon recommendation. Okay, thank you so much. Over to you, Robert. Well, you know, Beth, we keep talking here about the, the lives and learning of students in school and also the lives and learning of students after school. And I have here Andrew, who specifically focuses on just that type of issue. Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself and the program you're working with. I am the director of the Louisiana Center for After School Learning, which is basically the uh, Louisiana After School Network. One of the big things we try to do is promote quality programming because statistics have shown that the overall interest that contributes to uh, dropout prevention through after school is a fostered interest in the school day. If you're in a quality after school program, you have a 65% increase in attendance and a 63% reduction in suspension rates. However, after school resources are limited in the state and as you mentioned in the opening that 66 percent blame parents we try to focus on the other side of the coin which is the fact that after school resources are very limited in this state while we have a hundred thousand kids participating in an after school program we have a hundred and eighty thousand kids throughout the state that are left unsupervised during after school hours that's two tiger football stadiums filled unsupervised so what we try to show is the fact that the resources are limited for the parents. And there's a Gallup study that recently came out that showed the average American working family is working 48 hours a week now, 50% of them working full time. So my question to the panel would be, what can we do to increase after school resources in the state? Because unlike in other states, in Louisiana, we do not match the federal dollars that we receive for 21st century programming. We're going to let the panelists try that, but it's Andrew, and you've got a last name dangerous to pronounce. Ganeshow. Thank you, Andrew Ganeshow. Gentlemen or lady. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Uh, another initiative that has recently been started is a local church is working with a local elementary school to provide after school services. But the model says let's take bus routes. If you take bus routes, teachers from the school and volunteers from the congregation, you are able to increase the number of persons that can take advantage of it because you've, you've eliminated one problem, which is transportation. The second thing is members of the congregation feel uh, a need to give back and begin to pay for the program. So those are some things that, that a couple of organizations are beginning to do, and you put these programs within the community such that the children are only five or ten minutes away from home. I feel like our church is... Uh Mr. Smith mentioned that. I, I feel like they're an important part of the, of the community that educates our kids. And uh, when, when I was in Zachary, a lot of those kids went to churches after school to get that, to get that extra learning. And I think that's important that it, it gives a sense of community. And it's not just the churches. It's YMCA in Zachary and other groups that extend the learning for our kids in our communities. And, and, and I just think that's so important that we extend that learning. I think it's key to talk about this as an out-of-school program, too. After school is a subset of time, but we also have the weekends. I think that, as you heard, the YMCA, Breck is huge <coughs> here, and all of them have locations where something positive can happen, and I've seen it. I, I've worked with Carolyn McKnight, I've worked with Bob Jacobs. All of them are engaged in giving scholarships and hundreds of thousands of dollars of scholarships. So a lot of it depends on where you're at, too. I can tell you with assurance in East Baton Rouge Parish, there are a lot of out-of-school programming that is engaging kids in a positive fashion. So all over the state, people are dealing with this problem. We're talking about Baton Rouge having a really strong park system, a really strong widespread YMCA system. That's one of those things that really helps and maybe is a message for other parts of the state. Uh, Mr. Smith? Well, YMCA has, has created a statewide initiative to address that issue. Uh, one of the things that's been mentioned earlier is the connectivity between the school and the after or out of school. Increasing that connectivity, what we found is we have gone into the school system and hired 
the teachers that are doing teaching those kids during the day to come and be an extension of what they're doing in the afternoon and with that there's a continuity because if we don't have the continuity we, we, if there's a, a break in that then you have to start from zero again so our goal is to try to create that continuity between the school and the after school uh, environment so that they become one as it was mentioned earlier great and, and congratulations on your program keep going strong with that Beth? Well, we've been talking a lot about students, but now I have a 15-year-old student who has something to share with you all. Uh, Simone Craven, you're, you are at Baton Rouge Magnet High School, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about the program that you're interested in and then your question. Boys Hope, Girls Hope, Road to Excellence Scholars Program help young, help young academic scholars to become the very best that they can be. Well, that's a wonderful program, but do you have a question now? Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a question for the panel. Why do students drop out of school, and who are they? Well, yeah, what do you all think about that? You heard our data on that. What do you all think? I, I think there's a whole host of reasons they drop out, but we can narrow it down to a couple things. And a lot of it has to do with socioeconomic conditions. A lot of it has to do with confidence. A lot of it has to do with peer pressure. At the end of the day, when we look at a human being that's been nurtured properly, they have something called self-efficacy. They perceive that they can solve a problem and bring it to solution. And even when they fail, in the words of Muhammad Ali, they dust themselves back off and get up and try it again. It's these internal treasures that are not nurtured that leads to a dropout. And more often than not, from the external pressures, it's a socioeconomic condition that prompts them to drop out and either get a job or support the family in some form or fashion or something worse, do something illegal. Well, Kelly, you're a counselor. I know you must talk to young people. What, what do you think is the reason? I think when they lack family support, I think um, that a lot of times that, that parent is somebody that encourages a student every year that school is important and doing well is important. And when a student doesn't have that support at home and school is not important and grades are not important, then that reflects in their perception of how important education is. And that's a hard student to work with. In Freshman Academy, that's something we try to work on. We try to encourage kids to give them the support that they may lack from home. But I do think that is a big factor. Why do you think kids drop out? I think that kids drop out due to lack of confidence, family support, and sometimes lack of teacher support. So, and, and personal experience, have you had friends who this has happened to? Um, yes, ma'am. Some of my friends, some of them, they lack confidence, and I always try and give them words of wisdom to never give up. Let me, add, Warren, yeah. <coughs> let me add something here. Of 100 entering freshmen every year, only 19 of those students will end up graduating from college in six years. 19. Yet the, the old diplomas that we had, and I'm going to go back and talk about the State Department of Education, and since John White has been here, his vision for changing the programs and the way we do business. The old diplomas, we had three diplomas. We had a, a core four diploma, which was the college diploma. The vast majority, 60-something percent, went for that, yet only 19 percent would graduate in six years. Then we had the basic diploma, which was not TOPS eligible, and then we had a career diploma. But only 1% of the students chose the career diploma. Yet, I heard the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Adam Knapp, mention this pa past week on the news that Baton Rouge will have 17,000 additional high-paying jobs in the next two years in Baton Rouge. And the vast majority of them, even though the majority requires some college, it's not all about a four-year college. The new diploma system that John White and the Bessie Board has come up with is two diplomas. It's a TOPS university, university diploma and a TOPS tech diploma. What is the difference? Well, in the, pa in the old diplomas, you, a student in the eighth grade would select what area they would want to concentrate on. That's too young. That's too young for a student to decide what they're going to do the rest of their life. In the new diploma system, all the students go into the ninth grade, and if you heard earlier that the ninth grade transitional program, 
because if we leave them in the eighth grade, they will drop out. So we get them on that ninth grade campus through the ninth grade tr uh, transitional program. And at that point, they can go for a TOPS Tech or TOPS University diploma. The TOPS Tech diploma, they work like everybody else for two years, and at the end of their sophomore year, they select a pathway in the State Department through regional teams. In the past, we didn't partner with people, but now it's the, it's the uh, school districts, local businesses, and local community and technical college that are partnering to develop the pathways, and they've written these pathways that those students will choose at the end of their 10th grade year. And now we have to share that information with everyone, because this exactly. is some new, these are some new ways of approaching things, right? That's right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and I know when I was in the eighth grade, I, all I wanted to do was play the drums. So uh, since I didn't have any talent, it's a good thing it didn't go that way. But we have Kayla with us here. Kayla, we have the best and brightest to respond to your question. Tell us who you are, where you go to school. Um, I'm Kayla Jackson. I'm also from Tulane University, and I came here to support Jordan Lee. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask a question. The video clip that we watched earlier said that one of the reasons students dropped out was because they were being forced out by either um, failing grades or behavioral problems. Now, thinking about um, things such as uh, the Zero Tolerance Act, um, especially in New Orleans and other, in other places where the act is implemented, um, where do you expect the youth to go and how do you expect them to manage when they're in school systems that they're being arrested for throwing hamburgers in a cafeteria or rocks on the playground? And um, I mean by the, the second time that they're brought up on charges for petty crimes either that they did or did not commit, they're told by our police department and society and the school system that they're going to be back in jail and they're already feeling like they won't be able to manage. Um, so I guess my question is, um, how do we help them or convince them that school is a place where they need to be, where they, um, they don't have to feel police and uh, law enforcement inside the school where they're already fearing it outside? Kelly. We're fighting for every kid to stay in school. Mm -hmm. No matter how much trouble they get in, no matter if they've been arrested, or whatever has happened to them. And I don't know where that has happened where students have been forced out. They have never been forced out of Ruston High. I know that and I would think that that doesn't happen in a lot of our schools. I hope in none of our schools that we're fighting to the very end to get our keep our students in school. Now there are consequences to actions and, and when they get in trouble we do assign them to a, a special uh, place where they have to serve some time but they're still working on their school work and, and working towards that diploma. So for us, there's never a time. I'm never going to give up on a student. And that's why everything we do in our program with Freshman Academy and through our four years at Ruston High School, we're working to keep those students in school no matter what they're facing outside of school. And so, you know, we're there to encourage and help pick them up and get them back in school. If they leave, it's because they've given up, not because we've given up. Well, anyone else want to tr try that? Because, yes, yeah, Mr. Smith. A group of us uh, spent some time in Philadelphia uh, last year. And Philadelphia is implementing, you're right, uh, there are certain things about zero tolerance that says if you do this, you must go. But there's a new model that's being presented and it says that rather than the police officer coming to school, picking you up and taking you to jail, let's go sit down and have a conversation about what happened. Then let's put you in some programs that enable you to stay in school, but yet there are consequences and you may have to participate in some programs to make amends for what you've done because many times under the current system the school system's hands are tied because the law says you must do this but the community now is beginning to say rather than put them out of school let's keep them in school but yet let's have some programs to work on behavior modification choices and things like that. Mr. Drake, does the uh, Department of Education follow how many students are prevented from being in school as a result of legal issues or crime issues? Or I think there's some uh, monitoring of that, but I, I want to say that we try to save every child. It is important that every child, and I think the department's policies that we have in place right now are going to help every child find some way for the future. Uh, it's, it's really the way we used to do things, and I'm going to mention just the paradigm of education in the past, 
a teacher in the front of the classroom, 25 or 30 kids sitting quietly in desks. That paradigm has changed. The Common Core talks about uh, engaging students and having students be able to speak it, to write it, to use technology on it. So I think we have to make school more relevant for kids and more fun to be there. And I don't want to keep saying the word fun, but when they're having fun in school, it's not really learning. They're learning, but they don't really know it. And so we, we have to do those things, and those things are slowly changing in our state. Yeah, let more of them play the drums. I think that's the answer. <laughs> Kayla, thanks. Great question. All right, we're, we're over here. Speaking of choices, uh, I'm here with Mark LaCour. And Mark, uh, you're with the Rotary 6200 chapter, and you were involved with a program called Choices. Tell us about it. Uh, I heard about a, a program called Choices three years ago, and uh, it's where uh, community leaders, you know, like myself, I'm in the furniture business, or a lawyer or a doctor goes in front of these kids telling these kids how to be successful. And one of the things I talked to them about is being clair clairvoyant. We show them what a dropout's going to, life's going to be like. You know, uh, one of them this morning told me, that, you know, instead of having a car, they're going to be thumbing a rod, you know. So we let them discuss this, very interactive. And then we say, well, who, who wants to be like the dropout? Of course, at that point, none of them do. And at the end of the first day, we let them sign a contract, set a goal to themselves that they're going to graduate from high school. It is a great program. It's time management, like I said, goal setting, visualization, all that is involved. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, what is your question? I really enjoy it. And you talked about uh, engagement. How do I get, because I talk to people all the time, I send out 70 emails. I'm doing Gonzales Middle School. Okay, I need nine presenters. I got 70 on the list. I got six that volunteer. So I got to combine classrooms. How do I get those people to feel the responsibility in the community to help our children? All right, motivating, right, okay. Yeah, I like to uh, say I'm an entre entrepreneur at heart and uh, kids sometimes lack that opportunity to get into businesses such as your own and see that there are other opportunities and what is at the end of the tunnel uh, a lot of times. So sometimes business owners are looking for students that want to have that opportunity and when you take that opportunity away you'll see the difference but when you give that opportunity to a kid those business owners may embrace the idea hey I have a kid that's interested in becoming a franchisee here and they can interconnect and maybe strike some accord there where they both can move forward there. Yeah. Do you have enough volunteers? Is that well, what you're the, the volunteers is what I'm talking about. We go into the school, mm -hmm. and I normally ask them, how many of y'all have had someone like a business owner like me come into your classroom and discuss being successful? And they always do this, and they do that, and they all shrug their shoulders. Nobody's going in there. Ascension Parish welcomes us. East Baton Rouge Parish, not so much. We fight to get in those schools. Lafayette Parish, and uh, we're covering a lot of great parishes. We, we need... Uh, I, I want to do, you know, all of South Louisiana, which is our Rotary District. Uh, and I guess the question is, how do, how do I convince people to go in the classroom like I do? So there are two things how, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how, how do I uh, shame them or whatever it takes <laughs> to get them in there? Because, look, believe me, I get down on my knees sometimes and beg, okay. and then I get ignored. Okay. Well, first of all, all right. you're welcome to come into our classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Baton Rouge, Magnet High, McKinley Middle Magnet, Catholic School, Catholic High School. And, and you said something that's crucial here that we didn't highlight, that sometimes the heroes for our kids are athletes and entertainers. And we need grassroots people who started a business and run it. So you're welcome to come into our schools. And I don't have any problem finding people to come work with our kids at any of the schools. So whatever I can do is all off camera that we can get together. I can show you what to do in East Baton Rouge Parish. Well, we're going to share some information. We'll put it up uh, with uh, the people who are watching this program as well. So thank you so very okay. much. Thank All right. Well. Thank you. Tell us what's on your mind with this subject. A few moments ago, you did mention that some of the people who drop out of high school are drop out because of the communities. And I was wondering, is there a program to make sure that you move the people who live in the communities won't be as to the two drop out of high school. Kelly, you have some thoughts on that? Well, um, as we said a while ago, I think the programs that um, we provide through our clubs and our groups at school is a great way for our kids to be involved. Our communities do, uh, the churches are a great thing. We've talked about that too, is a great way for students to plug in after school. I think community is important. 
and I think um, it, it helps our schools when our community support, whether it be through making visits into our schools or um, if they just support us when we call on them and we need them to sponsor something or help us financially or whatever it might be. So I think community is very important. You're right, that, and, and we need to use our community. That's great. I think, uh, I think the biggest reason kids drop out, other than all the things we've said, is that they get behind in school. And, and the facts show that if a student is two years behind, it's almost sure that they won't graduate. So the program you saw on the TV to begin this program was West Baton Rouge Parish, their early childhood program. And some of the programs that the State Department has put in is to make sure our students are kindergarten ready when they get to kindergarten. And so there's a unified effort across the state and a unified uh, enrollment program where we can make sure that every child, even before pre-K, early steps, is ready for kindergarten when that happens. Well, when you do that, there's another part to this. We're not, as teachers, we're not here to fail students. We're he here to help students learn. And so even all the way through our schools now, most schools will give, uh, will waive seat time, for example, to give a test to make sure that, the idea is that they learn the material. And so the more we can keep a child in the cohort, and the cohort means when that child enters ninth grade, they finish school in eight semesters or in four years. So if we get them to that point, we're gonna get them through high school. So, so it, it's not just about dropping out in high school, it's about the entire education of our kids all the way down to pre-K. John Smith. Yeah, quick, your question was about moving the persons out of their community into another community. Well, what the 100 does and some other organizations do is it's, you can't up, uproot that family, but what you can do is create a new environment for those persons by selecting a community, taking those students and creating different experiences and exposures for them, which is similar to relocation, but now there's a different association which creates a different assimilation such that when they go back home, they're still together and not, not segregated. Richard, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm David Yassine, and uh, I'm also with Boys Hope Girls Hope of Baton Rouge. And what we do is basically, as Mr. Daniel had said, was we go uh, into the community and do uh, different extracurricular activities after school, academic workshops, karate, all of this to help us excel in not only just graduating from high school, but also to graduate from college. Well, David, what's your question? Uh, what I wanted to ask the panel today was that do you think that if more students were involved in workshops in extracurricular activities after school that yes it would help them to want to graduate and get uh, their career life goals but would it also I feel like it might even pressure certain students that they have to get all of this done and get all these jobs done and what could they what, what could y'all do to help these students um, drive away from that pressure and stress? So there's lots of pressure and stress, and we don't want to add more, evidently, with extracurricular. It can either be inspiring or feel overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. So w where's that balance? Peer pressure works both ways. You know, there's positive peer pressure that can, that can excel a child in that community. So if groups that, that are, are featured here today are engaging those children and they become the positive role models in those communities. A lot of times I've gone into schools and the uh, parents when we go into a school is that he's driving a nice car, he's wearing a suit, he must be a drug dealer. So we have to change that attitude that they have positive role models that create that positive peer pressure and that can create those community shifts there too so that they see other things that are positive that are only seen in other communities in their community. All right, thank you. Want, want to add something? I, I definitely believe that we need to offer as many extracurricular, whether it's uh, foreign language and elementary and, and all the different things we have, I think, because we don't know what will spark a child's interest in life. We don't see our product until a long time down the road. And so there's no doubt that is very important to me that we offer as much as we can. For well, thank you. I, I concur. Thank you. We need to meet our children where they're at. And we need to approach it holistically enough that mind, body, spirit, they're engaged so they can really internalize what they learn. Uh, David is a model student at uh, Baton Rouge Magnet High. And if you look in the audience, there are a lot of young people here from 
boys soap, girls soap, or Baton Rouge. They're engaged and so are their parents. That's the ticket in terms of pro-social activities and community engagement. Let, let me add one thing and give you an example of what I'm talking about, how we don't know. Uh, last year, for the first time, the state of Louisiana required every junior to take the ACT. In the past, it was only select students. And we were all fearful. I think everybody was fearful that the scores would go down so much. Well, they didn't go down. A great thing happened. We had two or 3,000 additional students who were college ready who would not have been had they not been required to take that test. So that's two or 3,000 students in Louisiana who now have an opportunity to go to college and meet their goals in life. Well, thank you, David. Thank you. All right. Good luck. Thank you. you know, before we go across the way, I just said, I want to mention something to you. Many years ago, we did this program uh, talking about dropout. And one of the key things for the women students, I have to tell you, was that having a child, getting pregnant. And at that point in time, you had a child and you had to get out of school. Things have changed, have they? Now, can you have a child and still stay in school? Absolutely. Yes. You can. But there are situations where it's, it's very hard. It's not an ideal situation because when they have that child, I have a student that had a child at the beginning of the school year and she couldn't find anybody to keep the baby. And so that was something we had to work through and figure out. She, so there are dilemmas to that. It's still not ideal. As you said, there are consequences to your actions. And, and I guess one of the things that we talk about in this data is that life just happens to some people. And that's one of the problems we face with these young people then, that if they don't have that caring adult right. to then help them, right? But one but comment on that. That was a community that partnered with a high school such that females that found themselves in that position there was a daycare provided for them such that the child could be taken care of during the day while that young lady was in school. And that proved to, to reduce the dropout situation based upon inavailability of child care. But we haven't totally dealt with that issue, have we? We have not. And Beth, the flip side of that is I think it's important, as we should have programs to take care of a young lady like that, we should also be teaching them to maintain their freedom to find a way not to make that decision. We also have that paradigm of the school being brick and mortar. Today, it's much more than that. Students can work online, do all of the work. We have uh, course supplemental course choice. If there's not an Algebra II or a Calculus course in a certain uh, school in Louisiana, they can go online and take the course. So it's not just in that brick and mortar anymore. So technology is open to all sorts of new windows to addressing yeah. that as well. All right, over to you, Robert. Well, we only have a minute or so left. Uh, your name is Justin. Uh, I'm a senior in Baton Rouge High. And uh, tell me, uh, are you involved in any special programs there? I am part, I am a scholar of Boys Hope Girls Hope. Oh, great. Well, how is that program working and what does that mean to you? It means to me by manage, by managing how how well I'm going to do in high school since I am at a level of which I'm ready to go to college and also how am I getting ready for life, like what my life choices are. That's great. And, and uh, is, what is you like best about the program? What I like best about it is the workers and the workers were really persistent and really optimistic about us and they really care about our problems and our future and our academics. And uh, do you know other students who are in this program also at the high school? Yes, sir. And tell me what impact this is having on their lives. It impacted them on, dra on drastically helping them on their athletics, on their academics, and helping them get more optimistic on their everyday life. That's, in that's incredible. So this program is really, a, really a, an important thing in your life, right? What, what grade are you in? I'm a senior. You're a senior? Okay. Senior. All right. And what are your plans for uh, after school? Um, I plan on going to LSU and do a major in East Asian languages because I'm really interested in going to Japan. Fantastic. Well, good luck to you in the next stage, and, and thanks to this great program for helping make that possible. So, well, I think, Beth, that's about all the time we have. Well, I, I guess we have to say good night, but we can continue the conversation online. There's technology. We can share some more information with our audience out there. And we're so glad all of you are here. You, many of you are champions for the young people uh, in Louisiana. 
And we want to thank our panelists this evening, Ronald Smith, Kelly Radcliffe, John Daniel, Warren Drake, and John Smith for sharing their expertise. We thank you so very much. We encourage you to comment on tonight's show by visiting our website at lpb.org slash public square. To explore dropout prevention resources and nominate someone as a dropout prevention champion, visit lpb.org slash American graduate. We, were, we would love to share those champions with the rest of the country because we are so pleased that we're going to focus on this issue for at least two years here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And we want to thank our studio audience so very much for being with us this evening. It's been great for you all to spend time with us. And uh, we encourage you at home to watch next month's, it'll be an encore presentation of Louisiana Public Square, the topic, Decoding Common Core still a very uh, controversial topic mm -hmm. and we hope you will find some information about that and we thank you all again good night everyone thanks so much thank you and applause to all of you all thanks. Thanks. Yeah. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. 